we were on Antone's tour, and Clifford Antone must have lost. Antone must have lost his shirt, his hat, and his shoes on them tours, so he didn't make no money. But the tour was great because it had Buddy Guy, Kim Wilson, Jimmy Rogers, James Cotton, Angela Straley, and her whole band, Chris Thomas King, who was then Chris Thomas and his whole band, and I was a guest, and lots of other people. Then we go to town and town, and people would sit in. So we're in San Francisco, and 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 I did my little spot, my little three songs, two songs in the beginning. And Mel comes to me and he says, Joe, if you buy the back door, my brother's coming. You're going to tell him he's got his postman's uniform on. Just tell him to come on in. And so his brother came and, he, and they would give him a hassle and say, no, no, that's Mel Bound, brother. Come on in. So Mel, Mel's on stage playing the guitar. He's playing the piano. He motions his brother over. Mel switched to the guitar. I forgot who was playing. I think it was Jimmy Rogers or somebody. His brother played the piano better than 90% of the piano players who was on the gig left with his postman's uniform on, and we talked for a little while, and it was the damnest thing. And I asked Mel, I said, man, how is it that you and your brothers and your family are so good at music? He said, Joe, my father was a music teacher. Now, I don't know if he told you, so he's my family music teacher. And he said, they had to, their dad would pick a note, and you had to tell them what note that was, what key that note was, and in which register. You know, whether it was an octave or the last note he hit. And if you didn't, you had to hold your hand out. And he said, we got tired of getting our hand in. <laughs> and I, I, man, I, I'll tell you, I learned some guitar licks from Mel, which, which is signature Joe Lewis Walker licks now, but I learned them from Mel. You know, I literally learned those guitar. I used to, man, you got to show me that, Mel. You got to show me that. And him and Wayne Bennett and Matt Murphy are probably three of the unheralded greatest guitar players to ever pick up a guitar in any genre. Well, Mel Brown for me uh, uh, was like different from most of the players like James Blood Ulmer is. And whereas a lot of guys are traditionally moving toward the Chicago or the T-Bone direction or even um, uh, Charlie Christian, Mel seemed to have his own kind of style, his own ear and the way he played the music. And uh, I mean, we didn't, we didn't really talk music a lot, we just were kind of friends across a business that there, at that time there were, um, there just weren't a lot of young black men that were involved in playing music at that time, African American men that were different from the way everything was. And he was, he was a different guy, he could hear music beyond just whatever genres people would think him to be, you know, um, popular in or, or you know that would be the normal ones that he would play. To me Mel Brown was uh, he was kind of like a musical parent is, is what uh, the best way I can describe it. I uh, at a young age I was so fortunate to go and get to see him play all the time and uh, I just looked up to him so much he was like larger than life to me and I thought that's what it is I want to do and at the time I was playing you know rock music in different different styles of music. So then when I saw Mel, I, I really sort of honed in on blues. And I said, that's it. That's really the start. That's where rock came from. That's where everything came from. And Mel Brown was like, you know, it's almost to me like it was like he invented it. He was certainly the best guy that I'd ever seen. Getting to know Mel was, was part of the journey. And uh, it, it was a long process, but it was a rewarding process in so many ways. And finally, I think he got sick of me asking him to make a record. So he said, okay, buddy, we'll try one. And we did Neck Bones and Caviar that won the WC Handy Award in the year 2000 for Blues Comeback Album of the Year, which was a proud moment, certainly for me, and, and I think for Mel as well. Well, I know it was for him. So that was, that was amazing right there. But just, just spending time with Mel, it was always, you never knew what was going to happen, but you always knew somehow something good would happen and it would be something you would learn from and probably never forget. And I'll never forget Mel Brown. You know, I've been listening to him play with different people on record. I heard him a lot on records. And I never heard him all that much in person, you know, a few times. But you know, I just always thought he was a, a great player. And when I didn't hear from him through the music or you know, through records or other people, I was always uh, inquisitive as to what was happening with him because I just thought he was an outstanding musician. And, uh, you know, one of those guys that's uh, kind of like, uh, 
you know, it's you don't understand why you don't see more or hear more about them outside of the circumstances that you usually know them to be in, you know. So yeah, I like I I I'll always have a tremendous amount of respect for his his ideas and uh, the way he played the music that he was playing. I really really thought he was great. A person like this shoes will never be fulfilled. I had a chance to hang out with Mel right after he quit Bobby Bland in Austin, Texas. And Anton was that ever musician you know. And I learned so much from him. And uh, once Bobby Bland had him and Wayne Bennett playing. And when you get two guitar players like that, that's unbeatable. So, uh, these are shoes that will never be fulfilled.